and I'm starting the stream. Okay, I think we are live. Um, I would like to welcome you to the penultimate event of this year's Weeks of Action Against Antisemitism in Cologne, organized by the Association Against Antisemitism Cologne and supported by the Amadeo Antonio Foundation and the General Students Committee of the University of Cologne. My name is Felix and it's my pleasure to um, give you a short introduction to today's lecture that will be held in English because we are honored to have Joanne Brown from Washington in the US as our guest. Joanne will speak to us um, on the subject of the anti-Semitic conspiracy theory, cultural Marxism. So why did we chose this particular subject for today's event? Um, in the number of own actors, um, the acts committed by far-right extremists have surged. In recent years, mass casualty attacks have occurred in the US, New Zealand and the United Kingdom, but also in Germany here, for example, in Halle in 2020 and Hanau last year. Uh, next to racism, anti-feminism, anti-immigration narratives, especially anti-Semitic conspiracy theories influence the perpetrators. By the great replacement narrative was examined by researchers as a justification for the attacks and as a conspiracy theory that unites these perpetrators and shows their shared ideological threat. The conspiracy theory of cultural Marxism arouses more attention in Germany just in recent years. Indeed, it is um, promoted not only by the alt-right in the US, but also by right-wing politicians in Germany. Among others, Alice Weidel and Björn Höcke from the uh, party AFD, Alternative for Germany, uh, both used the term but um, yeah, also bloggers like Don Alfonso spread the term in the conservative media outlet Die Welt. As we know that conspiracy theories have played an integral role in a number of recent attacks, it is crucial to shed light on the anti-Semitic character of the theory of cultural Marxism and counter its popularization and its spread in the mainstream discourse. This is why we invited um, Joanne Brown, um, today, who is a lecturer in philosophy at Gonzaga University in Washington in the US, so the country where the term cultural Marxism or the conspiracy theory around it originated um, from in the 1990s. Joanne has written numerous articles on the anti-Semitic uh, th uh, theory of cultural Marxism, but in her current research, she explores not only this misrepresented and distorted um, view of um, cultural Marxism and the Frankfurt School, but also, so to say, their, their real work and um, yeah, we work on fascism. And um, Joanne also tries to apply these insights to countering fascism and far right movements today, an aspect um, we might dive deeper into, um, into in the Q&A part of today's talk. Maybe. So just final remarks before I will hand over to Joanne. If during the course of the talk you have any questions you'd like to ask, please put them into the chat or send us an email to the email address below, and we'll make sure that uh, we get those to Joanne after her talk. So welcome, Joanne. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Felix. That was a really great introduction um, to the issue and the context um, that we're dealing with. Um, thank you so much for having me, and I'm really looking forward to talking with everyone. Um, it's unfortunately so very timely, right? And I, I want to talk about, 
kind of how I got into this um, question a little bit first. And then I do have some slides I can show you. Um, we can kind of look at the way that this conspiracy theory operates. And then I, I also want to talk a bit about how um, the attacks right now on critical race theory in the United States are overlapping in some ways with attacks on cultural Marxism and how both these conspiracy theories operate in very similar ways. Um, so, you know, just to tell you a little bit more about me. So I, um, I live in the Pacific Northwest in the United States and there's been a massive emboldening of fascist far right white nationalist movements um, you know, in the era of Trump in this country. But this particular region that I've lived in for the past like five and a half years has a very strong history already of these kinds of neo-Nazi uh, movements. So where I live, for example, is very close to the former head of the Aryan Nations compound in North Idaho. Um, and people in, in my town, you know, there's a collective memory of bombings of the newspaper, of um, Planned Parenthood clinics, of the home of a priest and so on. There were, you know, very violent attacks right in this region historically in the 80s and 90s um, by white supremacist groups. So the, the history here is very strong. And I did not know that when I moved up here um, five and a half years ago, uh, the, the perception of the Northwest US and in the eyes of many people in the United States is that this is sort of a a haven of progressive politics, right? And so before I moved up here, everyone was like, oh, you know, everyone in your town is gonna be like riding bicycles, they're all gonna be vegan, and they're all gonna be like going to indie music concerts. <laughs> and then like, there's some of that, but also I got here, I'm like, oh, there are also Nazis, right? Um, so we can talk about, about that context a little bit if you want. Um, but the other, the other side of this, so before I got into research and activism, around dealing with the far right and fascism in my own community and looking at how it was um, being supported and encouraged um, nationally under Trump. Um, I was also uh, initially a scholar of the Frankfurt School and still am. So when I was in graduate school, I um, did my dissertation on Eric Fromm, who was a member of the Frankfurt School, the Frankfurt Institute for Social Research. And I was looking at what Fromm called prophetic messianism or prophetic messianism. And Fromm believed that um, one of the great contributions of Judaism um, and one of the reasons that fascists most um, hated and feared um, Jewish people was what what Fromm called prophetic messianism, this sort of profound hope in humanity, in the ability of people to construct a utopian future, um, the beloved community, the messianic age, a period of justice and peace, whatever you wanna call it, right? This idea that human beings can bring that about. Um, and Fromm was an organizer and an activist and a Marxist. And so he was trying to sort of bring these ideas into reality. So I was fascinated by the Frankfurt School's engagement with um, theories of history, with theories of the authoritarian personality. And I knew that the Frankfurt School's theories were in many ways a critique of, of fascism because I had studied that, that work. But I was not really very aware of the conspiracy theories about the Frankfurt School. I had heard of the term cultural Marxism. I was vaguely aware that there were Nazis that had conspiracy theories about the Frankfurt School. But until um, about five years ago, this was not really a thing uh, on my radar. I think the first time I had heard about it was when Anders Breivik um, in 2011 committed a mass shooting um, in Norway against children. And he said he was motivated in part by this theory of cultural Marxism. This, he wanted to fight the cultural Marxists. Um, so I, you know, I'd, I'd been aware of it, but it wasn't something that I was thinking of as, as very dominant until recently. So I'll just show you um, a few things here. I'm going to talk a little bit outside of the PowerPoint as well, but uh, I think this is going to help us kind of illustrate some things. And um, it might help 
I don't know if there's a language barrier for people. Uh, Americans generally um, are less bilingual <laughs> on average, um, but uh, hopefully slides help a little bit for those that do notice I have an accent. Actually back, uh, here's my disclaimer. So I do wanna say, I am gonna share some memes, some images in this presentation that are um, racist and anti-Semitic. And I just think it's kind of important to see because there's a claim that cultural Marxism really is not anti-Semitic, that it's just a description of the Frankfurt School, um, that it's just a school of thought that we're critiquing. And I really wanna demonstrate why that's not the case. And these images are also, I think, gonna show very clearly how the conspiracy theory operates and what it attempts to do. So first, the Frankfurt School, just to be um, clear about some basic terminology here, we're talking about a small group of mostly Jewish Marxist scholars who advanced an interdisciplinary critique of capitalism. These scholars sought to understand why the revolution predicted by traditional Marxist thought had not happened in Western Europe, where it seemed to have been stymied by forces including nationalism, bureaucracy, consumerism, and fascism. Among the names associated with the Frankfurt School are Max Horkheimer, Theodore Adorno, Herbert Marcuse, Eric Fromm, Walter Benjamin, Leo Lowenthal, Franz Neumann, and Otto Kirchheimer. So this was my first uh, introduction to taking the idea of cultural Marxism as something I needed to think about. About five years ago, I got some mail, um, unsolicited anonymous mail from Nazis at work. And it was a packet of materials claiming to be explaining this theory of cultural Marxism. And as you can see here, we've got Max Horkheimer uh, with a you know, Star of David like imprinted on his forehead to just identify him as Jewish. Um, and it says on top here, cultural Marxism is the main ideological driver behind political correctness. It is the destructive criticism and undermining of all institutions of Western civilization and the traditional values underpinning it. So, you know, when you get a packet of mail like this, um, especially if you have a partly Jewish background, which I do, I'm half Jewish, um, it is scary, right? So you are like, well, you know, what do they know about me? Why are they sending me this? I was in the middle of organizing a rally against Nigel Farage, who was about to speak in Spokane. Um, so I, I took it as a threat, right? I was, I was frightened. And I've gotten multiple packets of this by now, and now I'm almost kind of used to it. I just like gotten 10 of them by now. So I don't know if this person is aware that, you know, I study the Frankfurt School, you know, it's whatever. But um, so, it, you know, but this is the kind of imagery, right? And when you look online, you Google cultural Marxism, you'll see more and more of these kinds of memes. Um, and some of them are worse than others, but um, you can get a sense of the way this plays into propaganda. And you can see here as well, right, that they're saying cultural Marxism is sort of behind um, what they call political correctness here. So the idea is that the things that we take for granted in society in terms of valuing diversity, equality, inclusion, and so on, um, are part of this sort of nefarious conspiracy um, that was implemented by the Frankfurt School, these Jewish intellectuals, this small group of Jewish intellectuals that fled Nazi Germany and came to America. So, you know, I was, as Felix was saying, you know, that you've heard this term a little bit um, in Germany from Alternative for Germany. Uh, and, you know, I'll tell you also, so there were two things that happened the same year that I got this packet. So I got the packet and I was like, okay, what, what's going on with this? And then um, a student asked me if I was a cultural Marxist. And I thought, wow, you know, I hope this, I hope this student is okay. Because this student was not, you know, uh, a Nazi, right? But I was sort of like, what, you know, <laughs> where are you getting this? Because that was the only context I had heard this term in. Um, but I did a little, I talked, to, I talked to the student, it was fine, he just didn't know what it meant. But I did some research and I realized, wow, you know, this kid could have gotten that term from almost anything. Because in the past 10 years, this has almost become the conservative mainstream. Not quite, but you will hear it on Fox News, 
There have been numerous right-wing pundits that have been using this term. Um, there have been books written about it by various right-wing media personalities. Um, and these are not people who are, you know, overtly anti-Semitic, uh, who are trying to um, promote genocide in some overt way. Um, they're right-wing, they're racist, they're bad, right? But it's not um, as in your face, right? It's this sort of like um, slowly spreading, slowly creeping narrative. And it, it's very adjustable, right? So it will present itself as being a critique of many different things. So people will say cultural Marxism is behind the LGBTQ rights movement, or cultural Marxism is the reason why we don't have great art anymore, or cultural Marxism is the reason why music is the way it is right now, or cultural Marxism is um, behind immigration or behind uh, educational programs in schools, right? And so the narrative gets kind of adjusted to fit whatever the person happens to be attacking at that moment. Um, the, the term started being used in the 90s. And um, I'll just stop share for a minute. So I'm just going to talk to you for a minute. The term started being used in the 90s, and it kind of emerges out of what Michael Barkin calls like the cultic milieu of these kind of fringe conspiracy theory groups. And then it spreads um, in the early 2000s, and it spreads through paleoconservative, um, far right, what in the US we would call libertarian um, circles. And as this conspiracy theory spreads, um, it slowly gets picked up by sort of more mainstream conservatives and it gets presented in a variety of different ways. So in the past few years, you know, we've heard it from uh, right-wing pundit Ben Shapiro, who's Jewish. Uh, we've heard it from Washington State Representative Matt Shea from my region, former Washington State Representative. Um, we've heard it from Alex Jones and Infowars, if you've heard of that kind of conspiracy outlet. Um, and it's also spread internationally, partly because of the role of um, terrorism and Breivik's shooting in spreading that concept. But now we hear it from Bolsonaro's administration in Brazil. We hear it um, from the prime minister of Slovenia. We hear it from Hungary. Um, we've heard it from, um, I believe, a member of parliament in the UK. Um, and this term often crops up in the context of attacks on education. Um, so especially in Brazil and Hungary, for example, the cultural Marxism conspiracy is seen as controlling the schools. Um, and we have to drive it out of the universities and drive it out of um, the education system. And of course, as Felix mentioned, um, oops, sorry. Stop share, I had to do this again. Um, in Germany, the two examples that I found were um, that we had, you know, we heard it from the AFD and then um, the former head of the um, Office for the Defense of the Constitution, which is particularly disturbing to me um, thinking about the ways in which this is an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory, thinking about Germany's history, um, you never really expect, you know, I know it's kind of your equivalent of what we would call the FBI. Um, you never really expect those institutions to be sort of bastions of, you know, liberation and emancipation for oppressed people or something, but you would expect with Germany's history some sensitivity and carefulness around that kind of language. So I think that's particularly unfortunate. Um, so just to back up a little bit here and talk about the conspiracy theory, anti-Semitic conspiracy theories about cultural Marxism vastly exaggerate the Frankfurt School's power and influence and rely on traditional anti-Semitic tropes. The cultural Marxism conspiracy theory claims that the Jewish Marxist scholars of the Frankfurt School implemented a slow secret takeover of culture seeking to undermine Christianity, family, and nation or race in favor of a new worldview and international system of control. The conspiracy theory claims that cultural Marxism already controls all areas of public life, political and social movements, the media, 
the educational system, entertainment, the economy, and national and global systems of governance. And of course, this is how anti-Semitism traditionally operates, right? It's the idea that there's this secret control. This meme, and again, this I'm sort of I'm reminding you of my warning here. I know this is a pretty offensive image here. Um, this is by Ben Garrison, who's a, a, a fascist uh, cartoonist who lives in the Northwest. Um, and this image you'll often see if you Google cultural Marxism, you'll see fascists and white nationalists using this image to sort of explain their theory. And I think it's useful because it shows so clearly uh, the way in which the conspiracy theory believes that cultural Marxism is this sort of hidden hand, this Jewish puppet master behind all contemporary social movements and institutions, right? So you've got uh, feminism, Black Lives Matter, the LGBTQ rights movement, immigration rights are all depicted here. Um, you've got communism with the hammer and sickle shirt. You've got anarchism there. Um, you've got depictions, racist depictions of um, Black and Latino people. Uh, I think they're trying to depict them as belonging to gangs. Um, and you've got images of the LGBTQ movement being uh, abusive towards children is part of the implication here, right? So there's kind of one, like everyone here is sort of this caricature that's being driven forward um, by this dehumanized insect-like, spider-like Jewish caricature. And at the bottom, you just have this sort of one like innocent human face, right? It's this little white blonde boy. Um, and the implication is that this little white blonde boy is being you know, manipulated, attacked. And often these conspiracy theories, as you can kind of see depicted here, um, will kind of have this homophobic, transphobic narrative claiming that the conspiracy is also about sexually grooming children for some sort of sexual abuse. And I think that is also depicted here. Oh, you can't see it? Oh, apologies. Um, let me try again. Do you see it now? Now I can't see the chat, so I'm hoping you can. Can somebody say if you can see it? Yeah, we can see it. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Felix. I apologize. So I guess you guys didn't, you kind of didn't see it when I was giving that whole speech there. I'm sorry. But you can see here, right? It's, and again, it's a disturbing image, but you can see how all of these different social movements are depicted here as sort of being driven forward and controlled by this kind of, you know, spider-like, insect-like, uh, anti-Semitic depiction. So as a depiction of cultural Marxism, what this image is supposed to show is, you know, all social movements, um, all social institutions are this, you know, nefarious Jewish conspiracy that controls everything. So it's very classic anti-Semitism, um, repackaged as cultural Marxism. Here's another one by the same cartoonist. So here we have a Ben Garrison again, showing FEMA, that's a whole other set of conspiracy theories. This is the organ of the US government that comes in after hurricanes and earthquakes. Um, but you have FEMA in their hazmat suits assembling this you know, big uh, puzzle and the puzzle is called cultural Marxism. And it's all sort of dependent on indoctrination in the upper right-hand corner, the indoctrination puzzle piece. Um, but if you look at this image, you know, obviously you've got, you know, racist and anti-Semitic caricatures. Um, you've got homophobic imagery uh, and racist language. Um, but the centerpiece of this puzzle is quote unquote white genocide, right? And so when you think about, you know, we had, for example, in 2017, one of the most terrifying um, events of the early Trump administration was the Charlottesville, Virginia hate march, where the Nazis with their torches, um, you know, beat up people in Charlottesville. And the chant uh, that aired on national media was you will not replace us and Jews will not replace us. And so this was America's introduction to the great replacement conspiracy theory. 
And the great replacement conspiracy theory is one of those areas where we start to see how malleable these conspiracy theories are and how they can be applied to multiple groups. So I do think there are distinctive things about anti-Semitism, um, but you can also see in the case of white genocide or the great replacement, how these conspiracy theories also get shifted, for example, to apply to Muslim immigrants, right? And the idea is there's this conspiracy to get rid of white people through immigration, through interracial relationships and so on. This one's a little bit more overt. This is the sort of thing I got in that packet of, um, of mailings. I mean, it's all very overt, but um, this one's just bloodlines, right? So this one's like literally cultural Marxism or cultural Bolshevism, as they'll sometimes call it, um, is an attempt to sort of eliminate white people, right? So that's one narrative that you'll hear. Um, so another thing that we're finding, and I'm not spending too much time sort of debunking here. So if you have questions, you can ask me in the chat. Um, we can talk about what cultural Marxism gets wrong about um, the Frankfurt School, which is plenty. Um, it's actually fairly easy to debunk what most of these people say cultural Marxism is because most of them haven't read anything by the Frankfurt School. Um, and a lot of the conspiracy theories are not sort of things you could prove, right? So there's a, um, there's a belief that that the Frankfurt School is like controlling television and like sort of beaming messages into people's minds and all kinds of very un irrational kinds of things. The problem is where we have to push back on this is that um, there are many people, including sort of uh, respectable conservatives, um, like even um, Tablet Magazine, which is a Jewish magazine, put out a, an article saying, well, maybe there is such a thing as cultural Marxism, we just have to define it differently. I think those kinds of narratives are very dangerous and we need to be sort of pushing back when we see that. Um, because this is not, um, you know, this has always been an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. It's a repackaging basically of the Judeo-Bolshevism conspiracy theory, which believed that um, Jews were behind communism. After the Cold War, um, cultural Marxism sort of fills a gap. It repackages Judeo-Bolshevism for a post-Cold War context. So it says, you know what? It seems like communism has been defeated, but really it's still lurking everywhere among us. Really it has won and really it is the Jews, right? So there's this um, repackaging of the anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. Within the United States, um, after the successes of the civil rights movement, which of course is still an ongoing project and not a battle that's just been won, but after some of those gains um, in the struggle against segregation in the South and racist uh, repression, white nationalists, white supremacists, KKK type racists in the US South needed an explanation because what had just happened wasn't comprehensible from within their worldview. They didn't understand how people they had dehumanized so completely, who their uh, racism was committed to seeing as less than human, were able to forge such a powerful social movement for change and liberation. And to process that, or to avoid processing that, we should say, um, anti-Semitism filled a gap for them. They were able to turn to secret Jewish conspiracy theories to say, look, you know, it looks like Black Americans successfully won gains in their struggle for liberation. But what really happened was this was all a Jewish communist conspiracy theory, it's conspiracy, you know, controlled behind the scenes. Um, and this view, in addition to sort of enabling white Southern racists in particular to prop up their racist beliefs enabled a new coalition. So it created a coalition between white nationalists in the South um, and neo-Nazi and fascist organizing in the United States. 
And this coalition forming in the beginning of the 1980s became the White Power Coalition. So the United States has uh, a fascist and white supremacist movement that's melded around this idea that the civil rights movement was a product um, of a Jewish conspiracy. When cultural Marxism starts to become more predominant as a narrative starting around um, late 90s, early 2000s, that helps to fill this gap further. It helps provide further ideological explanation for what had just taken place. And so white nationalists, fascists uh, in the US adopted the cultural Marxism narrative because it was able to, again, explain how all of these gains were being won um, by um, not only black people, but LGBTQ people and other minority groups that were fighting um, for, um, for liberation. Now what we're seeing in the US, um, one of the predominant problems is we are seeing this attack on critical race theory. Critical race theory and the Frankfurt School are two separate things. The Frankfurt School, as you know, comes out of Germany, out of Frankfurt. Um, critical race theory uh, emerges with some US scholars in particular. It does draw from the Frankfurt School, but it draws from many different intellectual sources, not just the Frankfurt School. It is not repackaged critical theory. There's a lot of other stuff going on in critical race theory. So you've got two separate things, which again, most of the conspiracy theorists and propagandists about these things have not read. But the two are increasingly being conflated. So you'll hear people um, who are pundits against critical race theory say, well, you know, it's really, if you dig down, it's cultural Marxism. It's just another manifestation of cultural Marxism. So again, it's a way of not only enforcing anti-Semitism, um, but also denying the agency of other groups that have fought um, for their rights and saying, no, all of your gains, all of your successes um, are really a product of this secret Jewish conspiracy. Now, I don't know what you've heard about this, um, but I will tell you, it's getting kind of scary with this right now. We have parents uh, stirred up by these right-wing think tanks and pundits showing up to school board meetings, angrily demanding that their children not be taught history, that their kids not learn about the history of, of slavery or segregation or genocide of Native American people in this country. Um, there is no teaching of critical, very little teaching of critical race theory or cultural Marxism in schools in the sense that you generally don't get anybody, you know, earlier than graduate school to sit down and read, um, you know, Adorno or um, critical race theory or something, right? Um, there are people, of course, that are engaging with ideas critically, right? And that want to help young people reflect on the racist history of their country. And how do we reckon with that? And how do we reckon with the fact that history is ongoing? And there's a defensiveness about this that is getting violent and that's getting scary. And the attacks are against teachers. The attacks are even against school counselors. Even school counselors that are working on like suicide prevention and things are now being told you are part of the cultural Marxism or you are part of the critical race theory conspiracy. So any sort of processing of the past or the present, or maybe even of emotions about the past or the present is getting attacked um, and labeled this kind of nefarious conspiracy that wants to harm our innocent children. Um, so this is very scary. It's an attack on, on education, on democratic institutions, on one of the few kind of free public things that we have in this country where so much is privatized even our healthcare, um, schools are, are becoming the site of attack. What are the reasons for this? Um, there are structural ideological reasons. Um, there are reasons why powerful right-wing think tanks are perfectly comfortable allying themselves with an, a fascist and white nationalist ideology 
um, simply for economic reasons in some cases. In some cases, they just wanna get rid of public schools. And this apparently is a line they're willing to cross, um, aligning with these kinds of conspiracy theories. Um, in other cases, especially when it comes down to individuals who are deeply devoted to fighting these things, um, but who may not be sort of full-fledged, you know, Nazis or something. I think a lot of it comes down um, to denial. There's a way in which denial about ourselves, about our history, about our past, very easily becomes violent. There's a sense of who the self is that is under attack. And there's a violent attempt to save one's sense of self from history, from facts, from the voices of people that have been harmed by the institutions that you want to glorify. Um, so I think there's, there's kind of a, a lot going on that's very deep with the fear historically and presently of critical race theory of the Frankfurt School, and even similarly, the Nazis hostility to psychoanalysis, which is part of as well, the Frankfurt School's research. Um, when people are that violently defensive, um, I believe there's something going on. There's a really interesting book that came out recently on Austria, um, The Politics of Repressed Guilt by Claudia Leib. And she looks at, at Austria and Austria's sense of denial and defensiveness about its history and its past. Uh, and she has this powerful chapter about in, in 2017, the potential opening of a Holocaust Memorial Museum in Austria. And many people sort of, um, reacting uncomfortably, um, aggressively, um, not sort of consciously anti-Semitic or something like that. Not uh, sure some were, but mostly not, right? But all of a sudden, all these defenses arise. People start saying, well, you can't have the museum here. It has to be over there. You shouldn't open it this year. You should have opened it last year. This year's too soon. You should open it next year. There was even a discussion, we're calling it the house of history, maybe we should call it the house of the future. And that is such an obvious psychological defense mechanism because no museum is about the future, right? <laughs> but there's this, this denial of the past. And I think fascism in general um, is based not on rationality, but on myth. And there's a belief that the, you know, kind of heroic people um, are, um, persecuted and under attack and have to fight, right? And that narrative is constantly disrupted by information from the real world. And that myth ends up being enforced more and more through violence to stave off reality um, from having to be confronted. So I think that when fascists fear the Frankfurt School, um, fear critical race theory, there's a certain rationality to that fear, but it's not that these things control the world and run the global economy and so on. It's that these things challenge them um, to think about what they're hiding from, what they're aggressively, violently hiding from. And um, that's certainly been the case with the, uh, the attacks on critical race theory here. Um, and it's the, it's the same thing with, um, with cultural Marxism. And, you know, one of the things you'll hear the most, sort of a drumbeat in the attacks on cultural Marxism is um, people are very, very angry about the book on the authoritarian personality. Um, fascinated and angry about the study of authoritarian personalities by the Frankfurt School. And it, it's, I think it's, uh, I think it's a defense mechanism. I think they see it in themselves um, and they wanna stave off anyone else or themselves knowing. And, but the problem is that fight against knowledge becomes um, violent. Um, it's inherently violent um, and it leads to acts of physical violence and including the, some of the mass shootings that we've seen um, in the United States and elsewhere where people have cited um, conspiracy theories like cultural Marxism. 
So I'm, I'm going to stop there. Um, and wow, I did almost take an hour. Um, I didn't think I would. So I'm, I'm happy to take questions. Hopefully you can all still hear me. Okay, yeah, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Jen, for your interesting and informative talk. And, um, yeah, now we come to the Q&A uh, session, part of this talk. So um, if you have any questions, please put them in the um, comment section or also, um, yeah, uh, arguments, discussions. I saw there was one um, comment saying that uh, just for your information, the cartoons in the slides credited to Ben Garrison are not really by Ben Garrison. I don't know whether you want to respond. Uh, I don't know the origin. So, Is that true? That could be true. So the one I was um, less sure on was the spider. The second one I know is Ben Garrison. Um, so thank, thanks for the correction. Yeah, maybe That's it's yeah, also not, not that I relevant, can... but yeah, it clearly depicted the anti-Semitic uh, um yeah content of this conspiracy theory so yeah so far there are not that many questions but um yeah just from my from my side maybe um you mentioned um the importance of the uh yeah collapse of the soviet union the end of the cold war um do you see um, a, a parallel between the anti-semitic step in the back legend in germany after the first world war um, yeah, which stated that German troops were undefeated in the battlefield and um, were inspired by the civilians on the home front, especially by um, Jews and yeah, socialists. And um, yeah, if we um, compare this to the contemporary notion that um, America won the Cold War against communism, but um, now leftist and Jewish um, intellectuals in America undermine these efforts. So uh, do you think one can um, yeah, draw a parallel here between this both uh, notions? Yeah, that's a, that's a great, a great point. Um, I don't really know what to add to that except to agree. Um, but yeah, I think part of it is the idea that, um, that there's, that, that what appears to have happened is not what happened, right? And that some that there's some mysterious force behind it um, in both cases that the Jews are actually running this thing that you, who you thought won um, didn't really win in the way that you thought. Um, yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you. There was uh, one question received via email. Um, the uh, person Frederick says, thank you for organizing this great event. I would like to ask Ms. Brown in which way the concept of cultural Marxism connects to the Nazi concept of cultural Bolshevism, Kultur Bolshevism. Um, it is the same idea in you guys or are there ideological differences? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it's basically the same. I think the difference is um, Judeo-Bolshevism was, um, you know, it was talking about the Soviet Union and it was talking about the Communist Party. And so there were real institutions um, that it was referring to. So it was sort of saying, well, this is all controlled by the Jews, right? Uh, it's, more, it's more nebulous with cultural Marxism because there's not like this one thing to point to, right? And so it just becomes everything that you see happening is really the Jews, right? Which Judeo-Bolshevism does in spirit, <laughs> but um, it has this real thing that it can point to. Um, but this is just an updating. I, I, I read it as just an updating of Judeo-Bolshevism. So it's just saying, well, um, you know, it's, it's uh, now behind everything. And one of the things too about anti-Semitism, and I mentioned this in, in the article that I wrote, um, Anti-Semitism often operates by blaming Jews both for capitalism and for communism. And it's a very um, convenient mechanism for the far right. Because when people have hostility to capitalism, you redirect that as a scapegoat. So you say, well, actually your sense of alienation and malaise or your economic suffering or whatever it is you're dealing with that might be related to capitalism, 
the real cause is the Jews. They're messing up capitalism. They're doing capitalism wrong. If we get rid of them, we can do capitalism right. And then the role of putting Jews behind communism fends off any sort of you know, radical worker solidarity. Um, you can't join the left because that's also Jewish control, right? And so it's a very powerful far-right mechanism um, to keep people in line. And it's not all that it is, but it's a very big part of what it is and how it's played out historically. Right, thank you. Now we have some more um, questions in the comment section. So one uh, comment just might be related to what you just said. So it's that it's an powerful mechanism um, also to undermine uh, yes, uh, forms of solidarity or joining the left. And um, the question from Peace Justice Reaction is, um, what are some important ways to expose and defeat how anti-Semitic conspiracy theories underpin the attacks on what is being called critical race theory? Yeah, I mean, I think talking about it um, is important and exposing it. Um, when I, you know, you have to kind of educate people in the US anyway on um, how anti-Semitism operates. Most people, even people, even activists um, in the US don't have much understanding of anti-Semitism. Um, so they very easily get confused um, by the way in which anti-Semitism, for example, presents itself as confrontation with power. Um, they get, people get confused like by memes that attack, you know, the banks or whatever, right? They don't always know what Rothschild, you know, indicates this kind of thing. So there's a lot to kind of educate people on. Um, and I think once people have that education, you just see it so easily um, in some of this propaganda. You see it very directly when people say, well, really critical race theory is really cultural Marxism. And you see it when, you know, outright Nazis say, well, really the really critical race theory is about, um, you know, cultural Marxism and the Jews. But you can also see it in um, the themes of these podcasts and videos by people like um, Christopher Rufo and James Lindsay, who are kind of the two big figures in anti-critical race theory stuff. Um, and, their, and their tweets. Um, there was one that was like, you know, Rufo was saying something like the Federal Reserve is getting in on critical race theory. And if you don't understand the history of conspiracy theories about banking and Jews and the Federal Reserve, you just can, you're just going to scroll past that, right? But if you know that history, you're like, hmm, okay, right? So um, the ways in which Hollywood is portrayed, the ways in which banking is portrayed, um, the ways in, I think, especially the sort of innocence of the children kinds of narratives, right? And they're coming for your children. And you can kind of see some of the blood libel, you know, type um, ideas coming, coming back in. Um, and another thing we have right now that's really a big problem in the U.S. is QAnon. Um, and QAnon's conspiracy theory um, is, is anti-Semitic. And it's, a ba it's, it's basically blood libel. The theory is that the elites are, the elites are kidnapping children for their blood, right? And they have these secret like warehouses where they're like getting blood from children and drinking their blood. And the majority of Americans have no concept of the history of that conspiracy theory. So blood libel is not even a word that kind of comes to their mind when they hear that. So I don't, I would be curious to learn more from you all about sort of how this would play out differently in Germany and have you started to see attacks on critical race theory. Um, it's getting scary with that here. And we even have states passing laws that you cannot teach critical race theory in schools. And critical race theory is not being taught in schools <laughs> in the sense that no one is you know, sitting around reading this stuff with their sixth graders. Um, but what this is gonna mean is you can't, you can't teach about racism in schools. Um, so, you know, so I think here, I mean, there are just going to be differences in terms of what people have been exposed to, what ideas they're familiar with. Um, yeah, thank you for this answer. I think we don't really have an equivalent to critical race theory teaching in Germany, but during the last years, we also had attacks, um, especially by the Alternative for Germany, this far right party, um, attacking um, teachers, which uh, or that teach. Um, um, anti-racist education and they, they argued 
teachers have to be neutral. So and um, they even uh, yeah ask students and their parents to uh, um, to uh, send emails to schools to the party to um, collect all these different incidents incidents and they created a kind of a pressure that teachers felt afraid of. Okay, can I argue that? Um, this um, utterance of uh, one AfD politician is racist. Am I then not neutral anymore? And what is the borders? So there might be a, a parallel, um, yeah, but without um, focusing too much on, on cultural Marxism uh, as a topic, but still um, trying to undermine um, yeah, anti-racist um, education. So... Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, so I wanted to come to a new question as you already argued that, um, yeah, to some, to some extent, that the research of the Frankfurt School, like the authoritarian personality, um, can illuminate a little bit um, of uh, the, um, yeah, the uh, foundations for, uh, for such a search of conspiracy theories. You mentioned QAnon um, in contemporary times. Um, and yeah, if one if one argues that um, um, conspiracy theories um, um, as a symptom can reveal something about the society we live in, um, could you elaborate a little bit more on um, yeah what Frankfurt School can tell us about the individuals that believe in conspiracy theories, um, the social functions of these theories, and also of course the social conditions in which um, they thrive. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And I think this is this is one of those areas where you can see why fascists have this fear of the Frankfurt School. Um, a few things come to mind for me. So, you know, my main guy was Eric Fromm. And one of Eric Fromm's best-selling famous books in the U.S. was Escape from Freedom, which was written in 1941. Um, and I was listening, I was hearing recently from someone who was saying, you know, one of the reasons anti-Semitism itself is not featured very much in that book is because he's frankly terrified, right? And, you know, there were still quota systems in the U.S. in terms of how many Jews could teach at universities. There was significant anti-Semitism in the U.S. and especially fear of, you know, sort of anti-Semitic uh, anti fears of Jewish refugees um, and especially Jewish Marxist refugees. Um, but one of the things from says in that book, I think is really important. Um, there, there's, this, a, there's this attempt to flee the, the limited freedom opened up by modern societies. And people have what he calls negative freedom, but not positive freedom. So there's this freedom from all of this kind of intrusion on um, belief, private practice of of religion or speech in your life. Um, the modern world opens up supposedly all this freedom from intrusion, uh, but there's a loss of meaning that occurs with modern capitalism and a loss of community. And people begin to flee the burdens of freedom by trying to kind of regress into feudal reactionary um, hierarchical mindsets, right? They're just like, please take my freedom, right? I just can't, I can't handle this. Um, and it's a response to alienation um, and, uh, and, individ and, and the loneliness um, and loss of meaning that people experience, which is not in any way a justification for it, right? Because people can make choices about how they're gonna encounter the void of meaning in their lives. Um, and you can encounter that in, like, in an existentialist kind of way where you're like, I'm gonna wait and see if anything appears or I'm gonna, choose to make meaning, right? And this is a very conscious choice to sort of insert what you know on some level is a falsehood to fill that void of meaning uh, and then to violently defend that falsehood. Um, but there are ways in which capitalism produces that alienation that then gets filled in that, in that way. Um, Leo Lowenthal, I think uh, his book um, really under read um, Profits of Deceit really powerful look at anti-Semitic propaganda in the US. And he studied all of these different anti-Semitic preachers and radio personalities, people like Father Coughlin. And it's the same kinds of themes, right? There's this offer of 
um, meaning of belonging, um, and also an outlet for whatever rage you have, right? That's gonna be directed at someone. Um, and conspiracy theories, if we're thinking about conspiracy theories more specifically, um, I think we misunderstand conspiracy theories and we start thinking conspiracy theories are just um, theories about conspiracies and some of them are false and some of them are true. And I think that's not the best way to think about conspiracies. Um, I think there's a fundamental difference between a journalist like investigating the Iran-Contra scandal and um, someone um, who believes in the cultural Marxism conspiracy theory or who believes in flat earth or who believes that you know, vaccines are the mark of the beast or something. Um, and I think the difference is that conspiracy theories as opposed to just sort of investigation of real conspiracies, conspiracy theories are myths. They're meaning giving stories. And so it becomes, a, it becomes a sense of identity for people. It tells them who they are, who's the us, who's the them, who's the enemy. And these are often stories that are centuries in the making where people are able to look back and see, yes, I saw how you know, they were doing this back in the middle ages and now they're doing this now. Um, and it, it becomes a religion for people. Um, it becomes this kind of holy, narrative that tells them who they are and how the world is and the fundamental battle between good and evil, which is very, very scary <laughs> because we have a lot of people right now, more and more people, especially to the pandemic, um, getting deeper and deeper and deeper into conspiracy theories. We see them advertised with like yesterday I saw um, David Icke advertised like paid advertising from Facebook. Um, so these narratives are getting marketed to people um, and um, once people get into those narratives, it's very, very hard to get them out. If someone just has false information, you can tell them, well, your information's false, here, here are the facts, right? But when it becomes who they are and their religion and their sense of self, like confronting it with information is like almost a lost cause at that point. Um, yeah, thank so you. Yeah, it's interesting that you also highlight the differences to like conspiracy myths, conspiracy narratives. In Germany in the last years, uh, scholars try to establish new, new terms like conspiracy narratives, conspiracy ideologies to highlight these differences to the like just regular conspiracy theories. But I think yeah, it's always hard to establish new, new terms. And yeah, the term conspiracy theories just so widespread and um, used. So yeah, but again, we, we also have to, to rethink the, the concepts we use for uh, such phenomena. Yeah, let me just quickly check whether there are new um, comments. So one person is arguing that um, in Germany, also libertarians have started to adopt the term cultural Marxism, but due to the memory of the attack of Kultur Bolshevismus, it is still um, possible to highlight the parallels to Nazi anti-Semitism. So this might be an argument why um, it's not as, uh, yeah, the term is not as widespread used here in Germany because um, the parallels to, um, yeah, um, yeah, this term of Kulturbolchevismus is still um, too, too open, maybe. So, yeah. But um, yeah, um, for the preparation of this talk, I came across um, an interesting um, um, quotation um, by William S. Lind, um, who also established this ideology. He, he was arguing that, um, quote, if we look at um, yeah, the uh, Marxism analytically, if we look at it historically, we quickly find out exactly what it is. Political correctness is cultural Marxism. It is Marxism translated from economic into cultural terms. It is an effort that goes back not to the 1960s and the hippies and the peace movement, but back to World War I. If we compare the basic tenets of polit political correctness with classical Marxism, the parallels are very obvious, uh, end of the quotation. So um, what do you think um, about the parallels of political correctness as a even more widespread buzzword and cultural Marxism? Um, yeah, what are the parallels? What are the differences? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the idea of political correctness is 
um, when people attack political correctness, it's because um, certain things have become less acceptable and on, you know, because of social movements and because those things have been challenged by protest and organizing and activism. Um, so it's just, it, it's another kind of version of this, you know, um, denial of the agency of groups that have fought for these changes. So it's a way of saying, you know, the beliefs that I thought were true, that maybe I held, you know, 20 years ago and still hold, but are less acceptable now. Um, it can't be that I'm wrong and that people have been rationally convinced. It has to be that there was this conspiracy <laughs> um, that, you know, the fact that so many people believe this now, it, there can't be any reason for that. There can't be any rationality behind that. It has to be this sort of brainwashing that people have undergone by this conspiracy. It's a great way of never having to confront any ideas that are different from yours, right? It's like anything that, anything that I disagree with, it's just, it's just a product of this conspiracy. Um, there was something else I was gonna say, but I can't remember. Um, oh, Lynn, William S. Lynn is a really, really interesting figure. And if we wanna share the article that I wrote with people, um, I've got some more material on it there. Um, Lind is a very interesting figure because he's able to, when you look at Lind, you're able to see the ways in which the mainstream um, and the extremes kind of cross pollinate. And there's not always this easy dividing line between, you know, like these are the normal conservatives and these are the Nazis. And I'm not saying all conservatives are Nazis. I'm saying that there's a blurry area in between, right? Um, Lind was close to the militia movement. He had uh, wrote a novel about, um, you know, going in, you know, these rebels who were going to go into a university and murder all the cultural Marxists. Um, and he had this whole theory of fourth generation warfare um, and the new ways that that um, that conservatives were going to have to fight. Um, and you know, there's such a degree of projection. Uh, in these groups too, where you kind of notice like they're often doing the things that they're so scared of, right? <laughs> they, they're, they think there's this force out there that's trying to like prevent their kids from learning certain things or that's trying to, you know, sort of slowly take over culture and destroy public institutions. But that's what they're doing, right? And that they can't look at it. So it's gotta be some enemy over there that's doing it. But yeah, Lind is a very interesting and important figure in this. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, just one more question. Um, um, what role played the um, yeah, discourse about cultural Marxism in the context of Donald Trump's presidency and also in particular after the loss of this election last year? Um, did it play a role at all or? Yeah. Um, so the, uh, you'll, you'll hear certain people in Trump circles use this term. Um, one of the biggest controversies was this um, Trump staffer, Rich Higgins, had a, a document um, about cultural Marxism and positioned Trump as um, sort of uh, a warrior against cultural Marxism. Higgins lost his position, um, but I think the line has moved far enough on this that, I mean, if that were to happen at the end of the Trump presidency, for example, I think he would have been promoted, not fired, right? <laughs> There's just been so much, you know, acceptance um, of this narrative. Um, it'll be, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how it crops up in terms of people explaining Trump's loss. I haven't looked at that. Um, I'm sure it's there because it always kind of steps in to explain loss. It's like, well, if we lost, it has to be the conspiracy. Um, we're seeing kind of similar versions of that, you know, with QAnon and these other kinds of conspiracy theories. It's amazing how many Republicans don't really think Trump lost that election in this country. I mean, they really believe somebody was behind it. The voting machines were rigged, you know, there were, the secret pedophile cabal did it, all this kind of stuff. And there's anti-Semitism baked into many of those conspiracy theories. Um, 
So cultural Marxism is just going to be kind of another piece of all of that. Right. Yeah, um, you received another question um, asked that you illuminate the reasons for the rising popularity of cultural Marxism a little bit more. So um, you mentioned, for example, um, yeah, the collapse of the Soviet Union and um, maybe also in relation to the thesis of uh, Samuel L. Huntington, uh, one could um, observe a shift from anti-communism to culture wars since the, coll uh, yeah, since the collapse of the Soviet Union. So do you think this is the most crucial um, um, point to, to explain um, the rising popularity? Or is it rather um, linked to gradual and incremental changes uh, um, yeah, linked to the successes of social movements like the feminist movement and also their incorporation by progressive neoliberalism. Yeah, if I understand the question right, I think it's more the second thing. Um, it's, it's still, I mean, it's still anti-communism. It has to explain itself differently because the Soviet Union is gone. Um, I'm not sure I totally understood the, the reference to Huntington, but. Um, yeah, because now as, uh, as far as I understand it, it's um, linked to Huntington as he explains after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Now it's less a, a wars of ideology, but more cultural wars. And here cultural Marxism oh. uh, shifts from, yeah, from the economic, uh, um, um, yeah, the, the focus on economic conditions, class struggle, now to culture wars, and here is a parallel. Yeah, and this oh. might be uh, yeah, the explanation. Yeah, I don't know. I, I have hesitancy about the term culture wars. Um, I think it's, um, it, I mean, it's still ideology. It's still ideologically driven. And what I think is fundamentally, um, not everyone that uses the term cultural Marxism understands it. Not everyone understands the history. Um, but I think fundamentally what it is, is it's, um, it's fascist. It's a repackaging of Judeo-Bolshevism as a conspiracy theory. Um, and, you know, fascism as an ideology is still very much with us and very much looming and very much threatening. Uh, and I, you know, there's this sense that, um, I, I mean, I think that sense is gone in the United States now, but there was a sense for a long time that was over, right? That now it, fascism is just, you know, fringe skinheads, the FBI will get around to arresting them, you know, fascism's over, you know, World War II happened, right? <laughs> um, but it's resurgent, you know, all over the world. It's a real social movement seeking power and always already connected to sources of power. Um, and, um, and fascism has always been um, a right-wing movement. It appropriates from the left. It tries to infiltrate the left. It pretends to be left-wing in various ways. Uh, it appropriates critiques of capitalism from the left. But it is a right-wing movement, and it's um, among its first victims are always leftists. Um, so, I mean, I, I think that in some ways less has changed, you know, than we think. Um, and there's a reaction against certain gains, but those gains are also really tenuous and really fragile. Um, so this, this conception of, of the, the anti-cultural Marxist is sort of embattled by this whole culture that stands against them is, is really exaggerated. And it's based in this sort of like myth of being persecuted. Um, well, actually, you know, um, they belong to a movement that's powerful and resurgent. Um, so that's my general take on that. Right, thank you. So I just check the chat again. Is there any question? I don't see any. There was one comment that um, the term cultural Marxism was already coined in 1973 by Trent Schreuer. Um, brackets critique of domination is sometimes brought up by tin heads as an excuse and oh, yeah. as rationalization but uh, Shroy uses the term like two times in a header 
And the concept is nonsense, ignoring the a priori of the critique of political economy and critical theory. So this is just that uh, I wanted to, uh, yeah. To yeah, no, that's, that's an important point because oftentimes people will say, well, cultural Marxism just exists. Like I'm just critiquing it. Well, if you're just critiquing the Frankfurt School, fine, go ahead and critique the Frankfurt School's ideas on anything. And keep in mind that they're individuals and that each person doesn't represent this sort of whole, you know, institution of, you know, like Marcuse and Fromm disagree on various things, but disagree with the Frankfurt School, you know, all you want. Um, but there are very few people who call themselves cultural Marxists as a sort of academic discipline or as an identity. And the people that call themselves cultural Marxists um, within academia, they're usually not scholars of the Frankfurt School, the people kind of doing like Marxism and aesthetics or something. So you can find people that say they do cultural Marxism. You can also find people who are, you know, left-wing activists kind of mockingly reacting against the conspiracy theory by saying, oh, I'm a cultural Marxist, I'm gonna claim it, which I don't think is a good idea, honestly. I kind of wish people wouldn't do that, um, but you know, whatever. Um, but there's no real thing. There's no real thing called cultural Marxism. People that study the Frankfurt School um, call themselves critical theorists. Um, and it's really only the early 90s that we start to see kind of conspiracy theory cults using this term in the way that we're familiar with it now. Okay, then um, I don't see any more comments or questions. And I would like to thank you again for uh, yeah, your very informative talk. and. Um, all the questions, um, the great questions, uh, the great, yeah, the great questions from the audience. I would like to thank the audience as well, um, but also you for the great uh, answers to all the questions. And um, yeah, thank you again for um, for your talk. We will have um, one final event of our Action Weeks Against Antisemitism, but this is in person in Cologne at the University of Cologne on Wednesday. So um, yeah, if you want to. Um, join um, this uh, this talk, then you have to be in Cologne on Wednesday and you will find all the information on our yeah, social media, uh, Instagram, Facebook, uh, etc. So yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for having me and for all the great questions. It was a really good discussion.